Okay, so this is page D11, and we started talking about phospholipids last time. And uh, just before we talk about the phospholipids, first, uh, and I did this last class meeting, uh, what's a triglyceride? So we just reviewed a triglyceride <coughs> is where we take one, two, three fatty acids and attach them to glycerin. All right? And they're important because that's how fats or fatty acids are stored in our fat cells. Now, drawn right next to it right here is a phospholipid. A phospholipid also has a, a three-carbon glycerol molecule, right? Just like the triglyceride. And just like the triglyceride, it had one, and it had two fatty acids attached. So the real difference between a phospholipid and a triglyceride is what's attached to the third carbon. And in the case of a triglyceride, it's a third fatty acid. In the case of a phospholipid, it's a phosphorus and four oxygens, known as a phosphate group. Now, we know that fats generally won't dissolve in water. They won't mix with water. Fats are hydrophobic. That word hydrophobic means they hate water. Hydro is water, phobic means to hate. And, uh, <clears throat> uh, however, uh, the phosphate part of the phospholipid is actually hydrophilic. It likes water. So we mentioned last time that what we're dealing with here is a molecule that's in a sense schizophrenic. Schizophrenic is a term that literally means split personality. Uh, now, the chemists really don't use the term that molecules are schizophrenic. That's a psychiatric term. They actually use a different term. I'm not going to ask you to know, amphipathic. But anyhow, the point is that the phosphate part of the phospholipid is attracted to water, and the rest of it, which is made up of fatty acids, hates water. Now, a phospholipid is commonly depicted symbolically like this, all right? And to me, when I look at this, it looks kind of like a balloon with two strings. Now, you might say, what do you mean a balloon with two strings? What if I held it that way? <laughs> a balloon with two strings. The balloon part is where the phosphate is, and it's hydrophilic. The two strings represent the two fatty acids, the two long chains of carbon atoms with hydrogen atoms attached that hate water, that are hydrophobic. Now, the importance of phospholipids, as we show right here, uh, is that they make up cell membranes. So those of you taking lab have already started to learn about cells, and you've perhaps already learned a little bit about the structure of a cell membrane. And the cell membrane essentially is largely made up of a double layer of phospholipid molecules. So you can see two layers of phospholipids. And each layer is made up of phospholipid molecules that are depicted or look kind of like a balloon with two strings attached. We're going to have more to say about these phospholipids when we get to cells and talk about cell membranes on page E8. But I'm not going to look at that right now. Okay, uh, let's, let's go back to page D3. And back on page D3, so now that we've learned on page D3 that phospholipids make up the membranes of cells, now I want to talk about soap. And uh, what is soap? So we all use soap all the time, whether we're talking about a bar of soap whether we're talking about shampoo, which is a type of soap, whether we're talking about ivory detergent used to clean dishes is soap. So uh, how do you make soap? Interestingly, uh, hundreds of years ago, the way they made soap was they would take fat from animals. And whether they would take the fat from sheep or the fat from cows, uh, they commonly used the fat from whales. And all you do is you simply take uh, and mix the fat from uh, some <laughs> organism with lye. You'd say, what's lye? Well, lye you needed to know for the, for the most recent exam. Lye is sodium hydroxide, or caustic soda, the active ingredient in Drano. And they would actually mix sodium hydroxide with fat. Now, interestingly, uh, when you mix it, you get a chemical reaction, and we use an arrow to represent a chemical reaction. How did we define a chemical reaction? A chemical reaction we've defined previously as a rearrangement of the atoms. 
And what happens is that uh, the uh, hydrogen from the fat or fat or fatty acid joins with the OH. And when you take a hydrogen from the fat or fatty acid, remember they're called fatty acids because they can release a hydrogen, that hydrogen, when it attaches to OH, what is an H plus an OH form? H2O. H2O. So the, an H from the fat or fatty acid combines with the OH of sodium hydroxide forming water. The sodium, the Na, attaches to fat. And sodium attached to a fat is called soap. In fact, many of the, uh, if you actually look at the ingredients of most soap, it'll say something like sodium palmitate or sodium laurelate. If you don't believe me, just take a look at any shampoo, bar of soap, any soap. That's what it will say. Sodium and the rest of the name is a, a fat. So interestingly, soap is a schizophrenic molecule just like a phospholipid. You'd say, what do you mean it's schizophrenic? Because the sodium is attracted to water, it's hydrophilic, just like the phosphate group. And the fat, of course, is hydrophobic, it hates water. So we've got a schizophrenic molecule like a phospholipid. So you'd say, okay, so what? So now I'd like to tell you how fats, how soaps work. Incidentally, just before we do, uh, again, I put a plug in almost every class meeting for the resources that are on my website. And if you actually scroll down below organic compounds, we've got various resources on carbohydrates, resources on lipids, and you'll notice I even have one on soap. So let's take a look at soap. Soap was first made by heating animal fats with ashes. Today, water at high temperature is used to directly break the lipids into fatty acid fractions which are neutralized with sodium or potassium hydroxide to produce soap and water. The soap is moved to giant mixers where perfumes and additional cleaning compounds are added. The soap is then rolled into flakes, cast into bars, or spray dried into powder. All right, well you can watch that on your own. It's a short video, but the point is they talk about how they would use fats uh, and add sodium hydroxide. Just That's what it talks about. It's just a YouTube video that's very short explaining what soap is. Uh, now today, incidentally, they usually don't use fats from animals. They use fats from plants. All right? So most soap that you use are really fats from plants that are combined with sodium hydroxide. Anyhow, uh, take a look at those various resources. I'm assuming you're using your book. You're looking at these resources to keep up with the uh, class. Anyhow, let's go back to how, uh, how does soap work. So let's consider the following. Imagine that you've got something greasy or oily on your hands. All right? You'd say, what do you mean? OK, I'll give you a couple of examples. You got spilled vegetable oil on your hand. All right? So if you had vegetable oil on your hand, if you just put your hands under the running water, will it come off? No. no. All right, some of you say, well, I don't work in the kitchen. You know, what do you think, I am a sissy? I'm not going to have vegetable oil on my hands. Okay, fine. You've got motor oil on your hand. Okay, you've got motor oil or ball bearing grease on your hands or transmission fluid. If you put your hands with transmission fluid under running water, does it come off? No. So whether you have vegetable oil or motor oil, oil, in other words, fats and oily, greasy stuff will not dissolve in water. They won't mix. What you need is soap. Now, when you have that oil on your hands and you now rub soap on your hands, now, when you put your hands under the water, that oil will now dissolve and mix with the water and it comes off your hands. What did the soap do? How did it work? I'm going to pretend I'm a soap molecule. And a soap molecule is schizophrenic. Part of it is hydrophilic and part of it is hydrophobic. So if I put soap on my greasy, oily hands, the soap or the fat part of the soap molecule grabs onto the grease and oil. Now, when I put my hands now under the water, the sodium part of the soap molecule grabs onto the water. So if I'm a soap molecule, one part of me is attached to the grease or oil on the hands. The other part of me, the soap molecule, grabs onto water. And what it does is it literally pulls the grease or oil right into the water. Does everybody see how that works? So that's what a schizophrenic molecule is capable of doing. Now, we would say that soap 
is an emulsifier. That's the proper term that we use. And what is an emulsifier? We wrote it causes fats to dissolve in water. Anything that causes a fat or an oil to dissolve in water is called an emulsifier. Now, in fact, we use emulsifiers for all kinds of things. In fact, they are commonly found in foods. So I want to give you a couple of examples of emulsifiers in foods. So let me just pause for a moment, and uh, we're going to give you a couple of examples. <clears throat> okay, so what I've done is I just reproduced the wrapper of a large Mr. Good Bar, Hershey Mr. Good Bar, which is milk chocolate with uh, uh, peanuts. And uh, let's take a look right up here where it gives the ingredients. All right, so what are the ingredients in a Mr. Good Bar? It's got milk chocolate. Now, there is a problem with milk chocolate. You'd say, what's the problem? Okay, the problem is this. Milk is mostly water. Chocolate is cocoa butter. And cocoa butter, which is a fat, won't mix with water in milk. So how do they get a milk, which is mostly water, to mix with cocoa butter, which is a fat? So it, you'll notice here it shows the cocoa butter, and it's got, of course, the, uh, the milk. There it is. Right? Non-fat milk. It's mostly water. So in order to get the water of the milk to mix with the cocoa butter, which is a fat, look at what they do. They put soy lecithin and a chemical called PGPR as, and what's the word? Emulsifiers. What's an emulsifier? Something that allows fats to mix with water. And we find emulsifiers in most foods. So previously, we've learned how commonly hydrogenated vegetable oils are found in our food, for better or for worse. And now we're explaining what emulsifiers are. Now, I'm not saying emulsifiers are bad. I'm explaining what emulsifier is there for. Now, if you've ever left a milk chocolate bar in a warm place for a period of time, you'll notice it starts to form white splotches. Uh, and, and what's happening is the milk is separating out from the cocoa butter. Because the only thing keeping it all mixed together was the schizophrenic uh, emulsifier molecules that basically allow uh, water, watery chemicals and fatty chemicals to mix together, like soap. Uh, just not every food has emulsifiers. If we, uh, if we go back to uh, page D18, D18, this is page D18. Professor, I have a question. Yeah. Um, is soy lechon, it's made out of soy? Or is yes, it is. Just, yes, it is. All right, so on D18, on the bottom right, this is the uh, panel from a, oh, I could go for this as well. This is from strawberry <laughs> haagen ice cream. All right? So, uh, haagen ice cream, strawberry. That sounds great to me. And, uh, it, and here it's, it tells you what it's made of, but I want to draw your attention to what's written on the haagen label uh, at the bottom. It says, haagen strawberry ice cream contains no artificial flavor, no colorings, no stabilizers, and no emulsifiers, and so on. So, you know, not every food has it, but you have to actually notice what's on the label. My point of explaining this is that if you don't, didn't know what an emulsifier was, you wouldn't care whether there was or wasn't in it, uh, an emulsifier. Now again, I'm not saying that emulsifiers in our food are bad. I'm just explaining what they're there for. Um, and, uh, but, so we're just trying to understand this. Incidentally, since we're on this page, let's just look uh, higher up on page D18. We're going to talk more about this at another time. This is uh, strawberry kefir. I don't know how many people have heard of kefir. Kefir is like liquid yogurt, all right? And uh, I would have reproduced a label of yogurt, but you know, yogurt comes in those round containers, and I couldn't get that label to lie flat. So I used a carton of kefir, which is similar to yogurt. Now, you'll notice whether you look at the ke strawberry kefir or you look at yogurt, it will say somewhere on the yogurt container or on the kefir here, a cultured milk. 
Does that mean that it went to finishing school? It's very cultured, very refined, no. What does that mean? What that means is that there are bacteria in it. There are bacteria. And in fact, if you look carefully, and you'll see this on every label of, of uh, yogurt, it contains Lactobacillus caucasicus and Lactobacillus acidophilus culture. So the way that yogurt, the way that kefir, the way that uh, cottage cheese and sour cream and uh, the way buttermilk are made is they have to actually add bacteria to the milk to turn it into these dairy products. Right? We will have more to say about these later. But that's what they mean by a cultured product. It's got bacterial culture in it. And that's actually, I might just add, considered very healthy and good. Um, okay, incidentally, one, one more thing here. Just uh, on the back side of the Mr. Good bar, look on the back side. So on the back side, this is uh, the side panel <coughs> from Kellogg's Raisin Bran. And I just want to draw your attention to a, a few of these. We're just trying to understand how to read all this nutritional information. So as we said, they always tell you a serving size, right? In this case, a serving size is one cup. And uh, <coughs> you'll notice in, uh, here it says calories, and that's per serving. And the serving is one cup. So there's 190 calories. That's without milk. And then it tells you how many additional calories there are when you put a half a cup of milk in. And it indicates the amount of fat and how much of that is saturated and how much of it is trans fat. And at least the raisin bran doesn't have either saturated fat or trans fat. Uh, it it's basically doesn't contain animal stuff. It's your raisin bran itself is, is vegetable matter. It's got zero cholesterol. We're going to tell you about cholesterol in a moment. Uh, it does have dietary fiber. You say, what's that? Well, last class meeting, we learned that cellulose is found in anything from a plant. And so it's going to be in raisin bran. It's in raisins. It's in bran flakes. Uh, because we said that the outer cell wall of all plant cells contains this indigestible polysaccharide called cellulose. And so it's also known as indigestible fiber or roughage. So that they indicate that. So uh, how much fiber. Did, did we say fiber is good or a good thing or a bad thing? Good. It's actually a good thing to have. All right, keeps our intestinal tract healthy. At the, towards the bottom of this, I put some arrows. And you can see they indicate again uh, how much uh, saturated fat and cholesterol and so on. And then uh, here you can see. Uh, uh, ingredients. Let's just look at ingredients. So what are the ingredients in raisin bran? It's uh, whole wheat, uh, raisins, wheat bran, sugar. And when they say sugar, they mean sucrose. All right, cane sugar. And fructose. Have we ever talked about fructose? Yeah, fructose is another monosaccharide like glucose. In fact, both fructose and glucose and galactose are all three C6H12O6. What do we call molecules that have the same molecular formula but a different arrangement of atoms? Good, they're called isomers. And you'd say, well, why, why would I know that? Well, because it was on the, well, the exam we just took. We covered it on page D1. So if you, don't, if you didn't learn that information, go back and learn it. Remember, our final was comprehensive. Uh, <clears throat> be the same kind of questions, basically. So even if you missed them the first time, you can still get them right on the final. Uh, okay, so we're just trying to understand what's in our food. You can call this nutrition. Let's go back to page D3. And uh, back on page D3, so we have been explaining what an emulsifier is. An emulsifier is anything that allows fats and to mix with water. Soap is an emulsifier. Now, interestingly, most of us have heard of something called bile that our body makes something called bile. It's just that we've heard that word, but we don't know what it is. Bile is actually soap. Our body actually makes soap. And bile is green in color. So essentially, our body makes green soap. It's the original simple green. Now, now you might ask, well, why, why would our body make soap? And the answer is to emulsify the fats that we ingest. You'd say, what do you mean? Anytime you eat foods containing fat, butter, 
margarine, the fat in meat, right? Uh, the vegetable oils. Vegetable oils are found in all bread and cookies and cakes. So we're going to ask you this question. Will fats naturally on their own dissolve in water? They will not. So, and yet, a, hu a living thing, including us, we're, what are we mostly made out of? We're mostly made out of water. We're 60% water. So how do we get the fats that we're swallowing in our food to dissolve in the watery environment of our body, in our intestinal tract, and so on? What we need is soap. And we call this soap bile. So the purpose of the bile is to allow the fats in our food to dissolve uh, or be emulsified in our small intestine. Now, where does this bile come from? So we wrote that the bile is produced in our liver. It is then stored in our gallbladder. And then it is carried through a tube called a bile duct. A duct is a tube. And this bile is carried through this bile duct to our small intestine, specifically the duodenum. And that allows the fats in our intestine to dissolve in water. Now you might say, I don't understand, I don't know what a liver or a gallbladder or a, a duodenum is. So let's return back to uh, page J5. We actually looked at J5 last class meeting. So we're going to look at J5 again. This was our picture of the digestive tract. And it looked like this. Remember this? So we showed this to you last time. So here, just to remind you, here is the liver. The liver produces this green soap called bile. Right underneath the liver, there is a little green sac. And that little green sac is called the gallbladder. What does the gallbladder do? It stores this green soap called bile. And then, if you look carefully, you can see a little tube. It's labeled the common bile duct. And this duct or tube carries the bile from the liver and gallbladder to the very first segment of the small intestine. And what do we call that first segment of the small intestine? It's called the duodenum. So we just mentioned, we talked about all those last time, and I'm just reminding you again today. Okay, let's go back to D3. Now that we've talked about bio, and, and, and you can understand why I explained what soap was. Because if I was going to explain what bio is, I first had to explain why you even need bio. It's simply soap to allow the fats in our food to dissolve. The last of the fats that we, we're going to talk about, we've talked about saturated fatty acids and unsaturated fatty acids. We've spoken of prostaglandins. We've talked about triglycerides and phospholipids. Uh, now we're going to talk about steroids. Now, the context that all of us have heard that word steroid is we've heard of something called steroid hormones. Now, first, what are hormones? At the bottom of the page on D3, hormones are the name for chemicals that are secreted into our bloodstream, that circulate in our bloodstream and affect changes in our body. So they cause changes in our body's activity. There are different categories, different types of hormones. They, the hormones fall into two major categories, two major categories, steroid hormones and protein hormones. So right now we're going to talk about steroid hormones, and then either later today or next time we're going to talk about protein hormones. Now, steroid hormones are actually made from cholesterol, and I wrote that right here. So steroid hormones, and we've all heard that term, steroid hormones, are made from cholesterol. Now, all of us have heard the word cholesterol. It's just that, again, we probably don't know what it is. So cholesterol in and of itself is not bad. In fact, we cannot live without it because all steroid hormones are manufactured or synthesized by cells from <coughs> cholesterol, this fat. Now, where do we get cholesterol? Cholesterol is in our food, uh, and uh, specifically, it is in any food from an animal. Anything from an animal contains cholesterol. So, meat contains cholesterol. Fish contains cholesterol, anything from an animal. Eggs contain cholesterol, because they're from a chicken, right? Milk contains cholesterol, because it's from a cow. 
But there is no cholesterol in anything from a plant. There's no cholesterol in grains or fruits or vegetables. In addition to there being cholesterol in our foods, we wrote that, our, uh, that cholesterol can be synthesized. It can be made from saturated fatty acids. And I wrote in the word liver. Our liver, that large, largest organ in our body, is a giant biochemical factory. And it can actually convert saturated fats in our food into cholesterol. So for most of us, cholesterol is fine. We, we don't have high amounts of it. And we use that cholesterol to make steroid hormones. But we know that people can have too much of even a good thing. If you, have, you need sugar for energy, but too much sugar, having more sugar than you should have in your bloodstream is called diabetes. You can't live without salt. We all need salt in order to live. And yet, excessive amounts of salt, too much, can contribute to high blood pressure. Well, uh, uh, saturated fats and cholesterol are needed. Cholesterol is used to make steroid hormones, but having excessively high amounts of cholesterol contributes to the clogging up of our arteries with saturated fats and cholesterol. That condition, which we've talked about previously, is called atherosclerosis. So too much of uh, even a good thing is bad. So for people who have high levels of cholesterol in their, in their body, so the doctors tell them, look, you got to reduce your intake of foods containing cholesterol. And incidentally, which common food has the highest amount of cholesterol of all common foods? Eggs. 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 Which part of the egg? Yolk. The yolk. Now, this actually helps prove my point that cholesterol in and of itself is not bad. It's just too much of it is bad. Because the purpose of a yolk is that a yolk contains all the nutrients needed to can build a chicken. That's what the purpose of a yolk is. It's got all the nutrients needed to make a little chicken grow inside of an eggshell. All right? But so if, if cholesterol was so bad, why would nature, why would God have put so much cholesterol inside the egg yolk? The answer is you can't build a chicken without it. But if you have too much cholesterol in your body, then you've got to reduce your intake of foods containing cholesterol. You also have to reduce your intake of foods containing saturated fats. Incidentally, both cholesterol and saturated fats come primarily from animals, right? There's no cholesterol in plants, and there's very low levels of saturated fats in, in plants as well. We did write that cholesterol is used uh, to make steroid hormones. Let's take a look at what cholesterol looks like by looking at page D12. We're going to look at D12. Again, I want to remind you we're still in chapter 2. All right, now on page D12, all the chemicals that are shown in D12 are steroid hormones with one exception. So these are steroid hormones, these are steroid hormones. In the third row, the only one of these chemicals that are shown on this page, D12, that's not a hormone, is on the third row on the right, that's cholesterol. Let's just look at cholesterol. Cholesterol is a, a, a it, it looks like a somewhat complicated uh, a molecule, an organic molecule. All it is really is just chains of carbon atoms with hydrogens attached, and it's looped into about five rings. Now, I want to remind you of something. Uh, remember a saturated fat? A saturated fat just looks like this, just a long chain of carbon atoms with hydrogens attached. This is basically what a saturated fat looks like. We talked about them previously. So interestingly, what our liver can do is our liver can take these long chains of carbon atoms with hydrogens attached and simply loop them into a ring shape. So it just loops them into a ring shape. And it joins them together. These are just chains of carbon atoms with hydrogens attached. And it just loops them into a ring shape. And that's called cholesterol. Now, uh, as we've seen in the case of sugars, once we understand the basic structure and we know the rule, coming off every carbon atom are four lines, right? So basically, so that we don't have to draw every single carbon and hydrogen atom, 
On all these other molecules on this page, they just skipped drawing all the carbons and hydrogens. All right? But these are all made from cholesterol. These are steroid hormones, and they are made from cholesterol. So in all, the, uh, all these hormones on this page, they just left off all the carbons and hydrogens. Now, uh, just to show you two examples of steroid hormones, here's a steroid hormone on the third row on your left. It's testosterone. Testosterone is the male sex hormone. It's called testosterone because it's produced in the testes of a guy. All right? Right below it is estrogen. Estrogen is the female sex hormone. It is the female sex hormone. Estrogen is produced in the ovaries of a woman. Now, the thing that I'd like to draw your attention to is this. When you look at this and you look at this, they look almost identical. In fact, there's, this is one of the main differences between them. I'm not asking you to remember this. But this, right, attached to a carbon here is a double bonded oxygen, and attached to a carbon here is an OH. I'm not asking you to remember that, but the point I'm trying to make is just a slight difference in the st chemical structure of that molecule creates a profoundly different effect on the body. There's a big difference in the effect of testosterone versus estrogen on the human body. So it is these very slight differences in structure that create all these differences in effect. Just to look at uh, these hormones, in the first row, it shows uh, hormones that I'm not even going to talk about in this class called mineralocorticoids. In the second row, it shows uh, in the second row other steroid hormones called glucocorticoids. I am going to tell you a little bit about those. And they include cortisol and cortisone. Now, I'm going to explain more about these in a second. Uh, in the third row, it shows testosterone and something called adrenoandrogen. These testosterone and adrenoandrogen are called androgenic hormones. Andro means male or masculinizing. These, so these are both masculinizing hormones. They create maleness, as it were. All right, we'll have more to say about both of those in a moment. In the bottom row, it shows two female sex hormones, estrogen and progesterone. I'm going to tell you about those. And then on the bottom right is another steroid hormone. It's listed as vitamin D. But you'll notice that its chemical structure looks pretty similar to these others. And it's made from cholesterol, so it's actually another steroid hormone. So let's talk a little bit about some of these steroid hormones. There are hundreds of them in our body. We're just going to talk about a few. So back, let's look on page D4. On page D4 at the top, so androgens. What did we say andros means? Male. Masculinizing hormones. Now, we've given you two to be familiar with. Uh, testosterone and adrenoandrogen. Let's start with testosterone. Testosterone gets its name because it's produced by the testes of a guy. It is the principal male sex hormone. Now, what are the effects of testosterone on the body? All right, so I've listed four. There are other fa uh, fa uh, actions, but I've listed four. So uh, testosterone increases physical growth. Now, we've learned that the term for growth, chemical reactions involving growth, are called anabolic reactions. Some of you might say, you never told us that. It's page A3. If you don't believe me, look on page A3. You needed to know that for the first exam. Anabolic means growth. We said that under the second characteristic of living things, the first characteristic on page A3 is living things are made up of cells, and the second was uh, the, the living things uh, break down food for energy, and the third was all living things grow. And that we call those anabolic reactions, the third characteristic. So that's why any uh, steroid hormone that promotes growth, uh, growth in height, growth of muscles, growth of bones, it would be called an anabolic steroid. So testosterone is an anabolic steroid. Uh, but interestingly, testosterone also increases energy production. It speeds up the breakdown of food for energy. 
And again, we learned that the technical term for breaking down food for energy is called a catabolic reaction. Again, we learned that on page A3. If you don't believe me, look. A3, that was the second characteristic. So testosterone is both anabolic and catabolic. It, 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 so guys tend to be larger in general than their, the corresponding female because of testosterone. And they br uh, break down food at a faster rate and generate a higher level of energy. Now, we know there's a price to be paid for this increased metabolic rate. Guys don't live as long. We've talked about that before. A third characteristic of testosterone is that it increases hair growth. Guys are hairier than uh, females, <laughs> except in one place, the top of their head. Uh, guys are more prone to be bald than female. For some reason, testosterone actually tends to reduce hair growth on the top of the head. And the fourth thing that testosterone does in androgenic hormones is increase libido. Libido means, everybody, sex drive, right? Sigmund Freud's favorite term was libido, right? So uh, anyhow, it increases sex drive. So it's not that women don't have a sex drive, but they can't even imagine what the sex drive of guys are. All right, so uh, all right, that's why all guys think about is sex. Right? <laughs> Women may think about sex, but they also want a relationship. Guys really could care less about the relationship; they just want sex. All right. Now uh, that's testosterone. Now there is another masculinizing or androgenic hor uh, hormone. Uh, produced by your adrenal glands. The adrenal glands are located above your kidneys. In fact, the word adrenal literally means on the kidneys. Adrenal. Renal means kidney. Uh, and uh, this, these adrenal glands, and males and females, both have adrenal glands. And the adrenal glands secrete many hormones, including something called adrenal androgen. Now, in guys, the adrenal, an the adrenal androgen is much weaker, much less potent than testosterone. So the adrenal androgen really doesn't do much of anything in a guy. Women don't produce testosterone. They don't have testes. So this weak androgenic hormone, adrenal androgen, is the only source of an androgenic hormone in women. The, the, depending upon how much adrenal androgen a woman's adrenal glands secrete can affect her hair growth and can affect her libido. That's the main effects that uh, adrenal androgen, having more or less of it, would have on a woman. Okay, what about the female sex hormones? There are two of them, estrogen and progesterone. They are both produced by the ovaries of the female. They are both produced by the ovaries. The estrogen is the principal female sex hormone, and I didn't list the chain, what it does, but estrogen is what causes the, the characteristic changes that occur at puberty as a girl changes into a woman as her body changes. So that includes the development of breasts and the enlargement of the hips and uh, you know all the other characteristic changes uh, that occur are due to estrogen. All right, so that's the primary female sex hormone. But then what's progesterone? What's that? Let's look at the name progesterone. Progesterone is make, contains the root in the center of the word progesterone is G-E-S-T. Jest. What does jest mean? Jest is the same root that appears in the word gestation. Gestation means pregnancy. Progesterone literally means to prepare for pregnancy, to prepare for pregnancy. So progesterone is a unique hormone. There is nothing similar to it in guys because guys don't get pregnant. The purpose of progesterone, which is produced by the ovaries of a woman every month, is that it prepares her body for possible pregnancy every month. One of the changes that progesterone causes to happen is an increased growth of blood vessels in her uterus. So every month, her ovaries, a woman's ovaries, produce estrogen that stimulate the growth of blood vessels. Uh, or vascularization, as we call it, in the inner lining of a woman's uterus or womb. The purpose of the, this is to prepare the uterus for possible implantation of an embryo. Now, if the woman gets pregnant, then those blood vessels will nourish the baby uh, growing in her uterus or womb. 
But what if the woman doesn't get pregnant? These blood vessels form every month, whether she gets pregnant or not. But if she doesn't get pregnant, then what her body does is it sheds these blood vessels from the uterus out the vaginal canal or birth canal, and that shedding of these blood vessels out the vaginal or birth canal is called having a period or menstruation, which we will learn more about later in the course. So menstruation is a shedding of the blood vessels, and that's simply an indication that the woman didn't get pregnant, because if she had gotten pregnant, she wouldn't be having a period. So uh, I remember reading a 19th century physiology book many years ago that described a, a woman having her period or menstruating was basically her womb, her uterus, crying because it didn't get pregnant. <laughs> All right. Which is, is actually, I, I don't really consider that sexist. In fact, if I were, uh, and I have four daughters uh, and a son, but, uh, and, and if I was ex trying to explain to a 12-year-old uh, a, a girl what's happening in terms of her body and menstruation, I think that would be a good way to say it, is her womb is crying, rather than saying you're bleeding. It's a little bit more gentle to say your womb is crying. So um, anyhow, uh, so that's uh, what those two hormones from the ovaries do. Now, uh, the adrenal glands, we said, secrete many hormones. Not only do they secrete adrenoandrogen, but they secrete something called corticosteroids. The corticosteroids include cortisol and cortisone. We had seen a picture of them on page uh, D12. Now, uh, the corticosteroids have many, many complex effects on the human body. I'm just going to mention one of their effects. The corticosteroids, like cortisol, raise your blood sugar level during stress. During stress. So anytime you're stressed, like, you know, and that includes even taking an exam or any other stress, so your adrenal glands secrete this cortisol and it raises the blood sugar level. So uh, that's one of their effects, but they have others. All right, now I'm going to give you one last example of a steroid hormone. There are many more, just like there were many other sugars and many fat, fatty acids. We're just giving you some examples of the diversity of the types of biological chemicals that are in uh, living things, including specifically us. So the last steroid hormone we're going to mention is technically called cholecalciferol. For short, they call it calciferol. I just underlined calciferol. It is also known as vitamin D for reasons that I'm going to explain in just a moment. Now, this steroid hormone, where is it made? It is actually made in your skin. It's made by your skin. Now, in order for your skin to make this steroid hormone and secrete it into your bloodstream, your, your skin needs two things. It needs cholesterol. Well, that's not surprising. We said that you need cholesterol to make any of these steroid hormones. The testes need cholesterol to make testosterone. The ovaries need cholesterol to make estrogen and progesterone. But interestingly, in order for your skin to convert cholesterol into cholecalciferol, or calciferol, it needs sunlight. So we have to get a certain amount of sun on our skin to convert some of the cholesterol in our skin into this steroid hormone. Now, what does a steroid hormone do? Like all hormones, it's carried in our bloodstream. That's the definition of a hormone. We gave it on the bottom of the previous page, D3. And what this uh, calciferol hormone does is it increases the absorption of calcium in your small intestine. That's why it's called calciferol. In other words, let's imagine you had a glass of milk. Now, milk is an excellent source of calcium. All right? So a lot of mothers will encourage their children with growing bones and teeth to drink milk. It's a good source of calcium. But interestingly, even if you drank that milk, which is high in calcium, if you don't have this steroid hormone, you won't be able to absorb the calcium into your body. You'd say, well, what would happen to the calcium in the milk? It would just come out in your stool, in your feces. You wouldn't be able to absorb it. So we need this steroid hormone to increase the absorption or uptake of calcium from our intestine into our body. Now, here's the problem. 
Um, uh, many years ago, about in the 1930s, 1940s, many nutritionists in the United States recognized that an increase, in an increasingly modern society, people, including children, were spending less and less time outdoors in the sun. Today, you know, in the old days, kids would have, be out playing basketball and uh, playing, you know, running around, destroying things, you know, especially boys, uh, out, outside. Today, everybody's indoors playing video games. Right? So nobody's outside anymore. So they, 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 and they, they were seeing this pattern even back in the 30s and 40s. It's now it's gotten you know, much more intense uh, like that. Everybody's indoors. Well, none of us work in agriculture outside anymore. We all have uh, jobs inside. So uh, the nutritionist recommended that they put that steroid hormone in milk. You'd say, well, why? Because we said milk's a good source of calcium. And if you can't make it in your skin, because you're not getting enough sunlight, like from the kids, you're not getting enough sunlight, so let's just put that steroid hormone in the milk. And that way, when the kid drinks the milk, it's already got that hormone in it, and then that hormone, the calciferol, will cause the calcium to be absorbed into their body. Here's the problem. When you tell the average person that they put a steroid hormone in their milk, what are they going to do? Right. Are they going to tell their kids to drink it? No. 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 So they don't say it's a steroid hormone in the milk. They call it vitamin D. So if you look at almost all the milk sold in the United States, take a look at the label. It'll say it contains vitamin D3. Has anybody ever noticed that? Now, if you tell somebody they put a vitamin in your milk, how do people think? They love it. In fact, they'll even ask which brand has the most. So in other words, everybody agrees they put a chemical in the milk. But if they call it a steroid, people freak out. And if they call it a vitamin, they love it. So they call it a vitamin. But what is it? It's a steroid hormone. And that way you can absorb the calcium. Now, increased new studies indicate that not only do children need this steroid hormone to absorb calcium for growing bones and teeth, but we also need uh, enough vitamin D for other functions in our body. Calciferol or vitamin D is needed for other purposes. New studies suggest that every adult should be taking 1,000 units of vitamin D every day. Because again, as adults, we don't get it out in the sun either. So we all need it, and uh, you should start taking it. It's good. It has a lot of other functions involving nucleic acid synthesis and immune system that uh, we'll see if we have time to explain better as we go on. OK, so we've been giving you examples of steroid hormones. One last comment about steroid hormones before we leave them. Uh, you know, on our page D12, if you start to look at the names of these, you'll notice that they have names like corticosterone and cortisone, testosterone, progesterone. You notice the, that many of them, not all, many of them have the ending O-N-E, um. How do we recognize carbohydrates by their name? Carbohydrates. OSE. OSE. All right? So uh, we start to notice patterns. So many steroid hormones have an ending O N E, like progesterone, testosterone, cortisone. That takes us on page D4 to the third category of biologically important organic compounds, proteins. So here's another example of a chemical. Everybody has heard the word protein before. But if I were to ask you what are proteins, here's what most people would say. Well, proteins, um, you know, meat. You know, protein, meat. Meat, protein. That's not a definition. In other words, we've heard the word protein. We know that there's some protein in meat, and we have no idea what a heck protein is. All right, so now we're going to learn about it. So proteins are more complex than either carbohydrates or lipids. They are made up of carbon, and hydrogen, and oxygen, and nitrogen. Does anybody, anybody remember the six most important elements that make up the majority of chemicals in living things? Schnapps. So this contains four of the six, right? The six were carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. All right, now, uh, proteins we wrote are actually synthesized, that means made from 100 or more amino acids linked together in a precise arrangement. So in order to make a protein, each protein is made up of 100 or more amino acids that are linked together in a precise sequence. 
Let's uh, first of all give you a sense of what a protein looks like by looking at page D13. So on page D13, uh, on, the, on page D13 in the third row, In the third row, uh, you got something that looks like a coiled up mess. And I think I wrote most proteins look like that. Now, in fact, if we were to uncoil this coiled up mess called a protein, we would see that that coiled up mess that looks like, actually to me it looks like a coiled up slinky, is that in reality it would be made up of a precise sequence of amino acids. So on the lower right, on the lower right, what you're looking at here, if you look in the legend, is it says the amino acid sequence of the uh, uh, chemical insulin. Insulin is a protein hormone. It is a protein. And each of these is the name of an amino acid. So proteins are made up of a precise sequence of amino acids. So before I can tell you anything more about proteins, I better tell you more about what amino acids are because that's what makes up proteins. So back on page D4, on D4, so what is an amino acid? We wrote that there are about, this page D4, we wrote that there are about 20 different types of amino acids. And uh, I kind of drew a picture of an amino acid right here say, well, what's that? What did, you, what did I draw? All right, so I'll explain it. I began with a carbon atom. So everybody see my carbon atom? It happens to be green. It doesn't matter that it's green. We know that coming off every carbon atom are four lines because it shares its four outer electrons. Now, uh, these are called covalent bonds. On one side, the carbon atom Attached on one side of the carbon atom is a nitrogen and two hydrogens. That's called an amino group. A nitrogen and two hydrogens is called an amino group. Now, on the opposite side is a carbon, two oxygens, and a hydrogen. And because there's this hydrogen which can be released, therefore it acts like an acid, it's known as the acid group. Now, technically, as far as we're concerned, all we need to know is it's COOH, or acid group. Technically, the way that really looks is a carbon double-bonded oxygen and an OH. Technically, it's known as a carboxylic acid group. Now, I'm not asking anybody to know that, but there are a few people taking this class who plan to take courses like physiology and so advanced classes where you're going to need to know that. So if that doesn't apply to most of you. All right, so anyhow, that's also found in a fatty acid, a carboxylic acid group. Now, uh, the, uh, we've explained that there's an amino group attached to one side of the carbon and an acid group attached to the opposite side, and thus the name amino acid. Attached always here is a hydrogen. Now, there are 20 different types of amino acids. How they differ from one another is what's, an attach what's attached right here in the R position. Where I wrote a letter R stands for the rest of the molecule. So all 20 amino acids have this basic structure in common, an amino group, a hydrogen, and an acid group. But where they differ from each other is what's in attached to the R position. It could just be a hydrogen. It could be an OH. It could be something more complicated. Let's show you what we mean by, uh, uh, again, let's look on page D11. <coughs> And I wrote that. Let's look at page D11. So on page D11, all right, so in the middle of page D11, you'd say, I don't know where you are. On, where, what page are you? This is page D11. This is shown in the middle, all right, and right below it on D11, it shows the basic structure of an amino acid. And it shows exactly what I just showed you. Uh, a carbon with an amino group, an acid group, a hydrogen, and the rest of the amino acid. Now, at the bottom of this page, it shows the pictures of five different amino acids. All right? And you'll notice that the bottom parts all look the same. 
How these five of different amino acids differ from one another is shown in the shaded area. The, this amino acid, called glycine, you don't have to know it by name, uh, just has a hydrogen attached in the R position. Here's another amino acid called leucine. It's got something a little bit more complicated attached in the R position. Here's phenylalanine and lysine and cysteine. So before we go any further, there's 20 amino acids. What do you notice in the naming of most of these amino acids? They end in I-N-E, I-E. All right, so we now know how to recognize carbs. They end in O's. We know how to recognize many steroid hormones. They end in O-N, O-N-E, like testosterone and progesterone. And now we know how to recognize many of the amino acids. They end in E, like glycine or leucine or phenylalanine. Incidentally, right above, in the middle of this page, it shows how these amino acids can be snapped together. And you'll notice it shows, uh, uh, here's an amino acid being attached to this amino acid, being attached to another amino acid. And the way these amino acids are joined together is that an OH is removed from one of them, and an H is removed from the other. What do you get when you remove an OH and an H and join them together? You form H2O or water. And right where the H and the OH used to be is where the amino acids join together. What do we call that kind of chemical reaction? A dehydration synthesis reaction. This is the way sugars are joined together. This is the way fatty acids are joined to glycerol to form a triglyceride. This is the way amino acids are joined together to form a long chain of amino acids, which is how we make a protein. Proteins are made up of long chains of amino acids joined together by dehydration synthesis reactions. <clears throat> Let's return back to page D4. So back on page D4, you say, what page are we? D4. All right, so we've learned uh, that there are 20 different types of amino acids. We've described how they can be joined together to form a long chain. Now, interestingly, we need these 20 amino acids to join them together to form the thousands of different kinds of proteins in our body. Because proteins differ from one another in the amino acids that make them up. Right? Just uh, earlier we had looked on page D13 and it showed you the precise sequence of amino acids that make up a protein called insulin. So these, if these amino acids are needed just like you need the letters of the alphabet to make all the words in our sentences, you need these 20 different types of amino acids to join them together to form these different types of proteins in our body. Interestingly, though, of the 20 amino acids, only about half of them, approximately 10 of the 20, are regarded as essential, meaning that we need, uh, they're essential that we need them in our diet every day. So you see, and the other remaining approximately 10 are regarded as non-essential. So you might ask, well, like, I don't get that. Don't we need all 20? Well, we do need all 20, but interestingly, the cells of our body have the ability to convert some of these essential ones into some of these non-essential ones. Just as an example, and I'm not asking you to remember this exact example, the amino acid phenylalanine the cells of our body can convert it into tyrosine. So we don't really need tyrosine in our diet. It's fine if we have it in our food, but even if we don't, as long as we have phenylalanine, we can convert some of our phenylalanine into tyrosine. Interestingly, though, we cannot go in the reverse direction. We can't convert a tyrosine into phenylalanine. So these are considered absolutely essential in our diet. Now, how do we get these amino acids in our diet? Amino acids make up protein. When you eat protein in your food, whether you're eating protein in chicken or protein in beans, we digest or break apart the proteins from the chicken or from the beans or any other food that we eat. We break them apart into amino acids. Now, any food that contains proteins with these essential amino acids, the amounts, these essential amino acids in the quantities that we need to keep us healthy, 
We call those complete protein foods. So what are complete protein foods? Those are protein-containing foods that have all of those nine, we'll just say ten essential amino acids in it. Now, if you're eating protein from something, right, yeah. or whatever it is, protein that's in, uh, I don't know, rice or whatever, beans, uh, and it's lacking, it's low in some of these essential amino acids, then we call it an incomplete protein food. So you might say, well, like, I'm not sure I follow you. Let's look on the next page, D5. So on page D5, at the top, is a listing of some common foods. You can see that, again, really what I'm presenting here, the approach that I'm taking, is not just trying to tell you a lot of organic chemistry or biological chemistry, it's actually trying to explain nutrition. What's in our food and what do we need? So here it lists eggs, milk, fish, cheese, meat, soybean, and corn in this chart. Now, in the second column, right next to where it lists the food, it indicates what percent of that food is protein. And you'll notice eggs are 11% protein. Which food that I listed in the chart has the highest percent protein in it? Soybean. Soybean. So beans are really high in protein. They're actually higher in protein than meat. I don't know if I've asked this before. Is there anybody in this class who's a vegetarian? Anybody? All right. So people who are vegetarians know they rely mostly on beans as their source of protein. Is that right? Okay, that's what people do. Soybeans are very good, but all beans are pretty good at high in protein. But that's only half the story because we've now learned that the protein in a food might not have all of the essential amino acids that we as humans require. So in the third column, they kind of give a score. That's what I wrote, a score. This is called the net protein utilization. What that means is, is this score, and you can think of it like a rating or a percent score, is an indication of to what extent that food provides all of the essential amino acids in the protein in that food that we as humans require. You'll notice that soybeans, even though they're 34% protein, only have a rating or a score of 60 out of 100. So in other words, why it's only given a score of, we'll call it 60%, which would be a D on an exam, is because it doesn't have all of the essential amino acids that we require as humans. So interestingly, which food comes closest to having almost a perfect 100% A score? Eggs. So eggs have an almost perfect score that even though eggs are only 11% protein, the protein that is in eggs contains very high amounts of those essential amino acids that we as humans require. <clears throat> so in fact, that's part of the advertising campaign of eggs. They will advertise eggs as nature's most perfect food. Yes. Has anybody ever heard that phrase? Yeah. That's where it comes from. Because of all the foods, it's got the best balance of essential amino acids in it. Now, uh, you'll notice that even meat is not as high a score as uh, eggs are. Even milk has actually got a better score than meat. But in terms of uh, vegetarians, since vegetarians aren't eating meat, and some vegetar vegetarians, like vegans, don't even eat eggs, right? So then they have to, if they're relying on beans and vegetables and so on, then they have to mix and match their foods. So they have to actually learn which foods, in other words, if they use beans, and beans are low in some of the essential amino acids, they learn that rice or corn has some of those essential amino acids in them that are lacking in beans. So that's why in various places in the world they can't come up with these cuisines where you have uh, beans and rice, or beans and corn. Does that ring a bell? Like, uh, you know, Mexican food and so on? Because when you're eating a vegetarian diet, you've got to actually mix different types of foods to ensure that we get all of the essential amino acids that are needed to stay healthy. Now, of course, a lot of these cuisines go back hundreds, thousands of years before the time of modern biochemistry and nutrition. But probably people from their folk traditions recognized that if you eat certain combinations of food, you stayed healthier than if you didn't. 
So they developed these cuisines of, of the way you eat, not because they actually knew what amino acids were in which food, but they knew that combining the different foods kept people healthier than not combining them. All right, but today we actually can analyze this. So uh, in the last column here, the fourth column on the right, so when we actually analyze how much of a food we need, we have to take into account not only what percent protein is in the food, but to what extent the protein in that food provides all of the essential amino acids, or that it doesn't. So the government comes up with various charts. Uh, in this case, this is indicating the, uh, the MDR. Now, MDR does not stand for Marina Del Rey. It stands for <laughs> Minimum Daily Requirement. So this is indicating the minimum, the minimum amount of that food you would have to eat every day uh, just to stay alive. Now, it's kind of a silly idea because more normal people don't just rely on eating one food, and most of us are eating way more food than you know, the minimum to stay alive. But uh, in fact, another uh, thing, though, that I'd like to mention is something called the RDA. The RDA is actually found more commonly, it's produced by the government, it stands for, write it down, the recommended daily allowance, I want you to know it. This is a much higher amount of uh, the food that you need to stay, not just alive, but healthy. So that's called the recommended daily allowance. So just to show you what we mean by any of this, if we were to, uh, let's just look on, we passed this out earlier today, the Raisin Brand label. So in other words, when they list, when they're listing these nutrients, right, and they list vitamin A and, you know, iron and uh, all these other things, right, and it's got a percent, that's actually the recommended daily allowance. So it's saying that one serving or one cup of Raisin Bran provides 10% of the recommended daily allowance you need of vitamin A. So whenever you look at these labels, they commonly will tell you that a serving, one serving, will provide what percent of what the government recommends to stay healthy. All right? And you'll notice, for example, that Raisin Bran provides 0% of vitamin C because that doesn't mean that every food contains all the nutrients you need. Right? So there's all kinds of charts as far as providing what percent of uh, what you need. Here you can see that, here this uh, up higher up, it says that, uh, that one serving provides 15% of the carbohydrates we need to stay healthy, or 15% of the sodium we need. All right, so that's what's called the recommended daily allowance. Okay, now, there are thousands of different kinds of proteins in our body. Thousands of different kinds of proteins in every other living thing. <clears throat> How do these proteins differ from one another? If there are thousands of different kinds of proteins in our body, what's the difference between one protein and any of the other uh, uh, thousands of proteins? The proteins differ, number one, in the number of amino acids. Some proteins are 100 amino acids long, some proteins are 600 amino acids long. So they can vary as far as how many amino acids long they are. Secondly, proteins differ in the types of amino acids. Some proteins contain all 20 different types of amino acids. Other proteins may only have six or eight of the 20 different types of amino acids in them. Thirdly, the proteins vary in the ordering of those amino acids. Even if we had two proteins, both containing the, all 20 amino acids, they're not necessarily arranged in the same sequence or the same order. And fourthly, the proteins vary in how they are coiled up. Because these chains of amino acids become coiled up into what look like coiled up messes or uh, coiled up slinkies. And so they vary in their three-dimensional shape. That's how proteins vary from one another. Now, just before I go any further, let me just try to clarify a point that that's com students commonly don't get. And hopefully, this will help you understand something. Um, you know, we commonly hear this expression, 
You are what you eat. Uh, I don't think that's true at all. If you eat chicken, do you become a chicken? <laughs> if you're a vegetarian, do you turn into a vegetable plant? No. So in what way are you what you eat? The fact is, you don't become what you eat. It wouldn't matter what you ate, whether you're a meat eater or a vegetarian, whether you eat junk food or healthy food, it won't change the color of your eyes. It won't change your blood type. It won't change uh, most of the chemicals that are in your body. Now, I'm not, it does make a difference what we eat, because some foods are healthier than others. All right? But it doesn't change your physical characteristics. Whether you have freckles or dimples is not changed at all by what you eat. All right? So you, don't, you, you are not what you eat. All right? Okay? It affects the amount of fat, maybe, but that doesn't affect your blood type or your eye color or your hair color. So why not? Well, if you eat chicken, why don't you become a chicken? If you eat only vegetables, why don't you turn into a cucumber or a, a squash? And here's why, and I want to make this clear. Everything that we eat is digested into tiny little pieces. Specifically, carbs. Carbohydrates are broken apart into monosaccharides, and that's what we absorb. Fats are broken apart into fatty acids and cholesterol, and that's what we absorb. Proteins in the food that we eat, whether it's protein from a chicken or protein from a bean plant, we break apart or digest the proteins in our food into individual amino acids. That's what we actually absorb into our bloodstream, our amino acids. And then what we do with those amino acids is we reassemble those amino acids into human proteins. Now, how does our body know to take the amino acids that we absorb from our foods that we eat and to join them together to, into human proteins? That's what your genetic code is for. Your DNA, your genetic code, is the instructions for how to rearrange those amino acids that you absorb from whatever food you ate and to join them into human proteins. So it won't matter if for the rest of your life you only eat vegetables, you will never turn into a vegetable. You will be made out of human proteins. All you are doing with that food is using them as a source of amino acids, and then you reassemble them into human proteins. Now, because my DNA is a little bit different from any of your DNA, it's all of our DNA is probably 99.9% .9 identical. But it's not 100% identical. And it's that less than 0.1% difference in our DNA or genetic code that makes me me and you you. But 99.9% .9 of the proteins in all of our bodies are identical. They are human proteins. But those less than 0.1% difference in our proteins uh, is why we look different. And, and how is, uh, what determines the kind of proteins we make? Our genetic code, our DNA.